for uh, inviting me to this uh, summer school. I learned a lot, uh, especially from some of the talks I just don't have the opportunity to hear in other conferences, so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, uh, so you mentioned that I recently moved from London. Uh, in fact, among the three co-founders in the Gatsby Computational uh, Neuroscience Unit, uh, we all have left. One, went, one is Jeff Hinton, who went to back to Toronto. Two is uh, uh, Peter Dyer and, and myself, uh, we moved to Tübingen. So welcome to Tübingen if you'd like to uh, come visit. Yeah? And uh, today uh, I'll talk about essential uh, uh, peripheral uh, dichotomy in visual decoding. And another title of this talk could be Understanding Vision Beyond V1. Yeah? And I'd just like to uh, ask, uh, who haven't heard about V1? Very good, okay? And so V1 is this uh, uh, back of the brain, and if you open this uh, brain up, it, uh, you know, this is the two retina, and retina signal is then passed to the back of the brain. This is actually the monkey brain, yeah? On the back of the brain, and then it goes on to the rest of the uh, visual cortex. So you see V1 is very big, but people used to think about V1 is kind of early, early vision. I hope that today I can convince you that it's probably the center of vision, yeah? And understanding vision beyond V1 seems to be a very big patch because the colored part of the brain map is exclusively for vision and the non-colored part is not exclusive. Sometimes non-vision at all, sometimes it's also with other part of the, uh, uh, the brain. So the motivation, why do we want to study central peripheral uh, dichotomy? The motivation is, um, this is some early photo. People, here is uh, David Hubel, Torsten Weasel. Who haven't heard about David Hubel and Torsten Weasel? Okay, a few. Okay, so today the talk is very conceptual. So even if you haven't heard David Hubel, Torsten Weasel, you will understand, yeah? So that's the idea. The brain is like that, and the people study vision by putting an animal in front of a screen, and show things on the screen, and then measure the neurons' activities, and see what kind of input make neurons uh, be active. So this person, Steve Kufler, who was uh, the teacher of Torsten, uh, Hubel, and Weasel, in 1950, he studied with the retina, and find that the retina neurons uh, will respond to dots on a screen, okay? One neuron from one dot, another neuron. So this is something Chicharovsky talked about retina neurons, so dots, dots, dots. But sometimes it's a dots of the center surround dots, so that, that's why it could be white dots in the back background, black dots in white background, and so on. And then the, the two junior uh, students of him, or maybe postdoc of him, okay, like to take this paradigm to the next stage. Now what is this paradigm called? It's called feature detectors. So you just detect features in the visual inputs, yeah? So in this case, the retina detects features of dots. So they went to the next stage. This is V1, also called the primary visual cortex. And then they find that the features that make neurons fire, one neuron like to have white vertical bar, another neuron like to have you know, black horizontal bar, one bar here, one bar there, and some are color bar, some are non -color, you know. Some bars can move in one direction, other bars, other neurons like to prefer neurons move in the other direction and so on. So now feature detector has advanced. Well, notice that they actually did their work roughly 10 years. So the 10 years discovered a tremendous amount of things based on which a lot of deep neural networks early stage, right, the first layer is kind of a mimicking that stage. And their work is uh, recognized by Nobel Prize. So if you are a newcomer into this field, it's like, okay, 10 years to conquer V1, you might want to spend the next 10 years going to the next brain area, next 10, next brain area, and so on, right? And of course, the vision field exploded, more researches, higher technologies to you. Now you can measure by, you know, peril, lots of things. However, 50 years later, this is what happened. Okay, 50 years later, they had a celebration in Neuron, the, the, the very high impact journal in the, in the field to celebrate their uh, success, Huber Weasel success. And David Huber was asked, what do you feel are the next big question in the field? This is as if, uh, well anyway, 
He said, we have some idea for the retina, for the lateral geniculus body, which is this little body on the way to V1, yeah? And the primary visual cortex, that's about it. So now, if you're in the field, well, that's a very unpopular thing to say, you know, as if nothing has happened, yeah? Well, unfortunately, there's some truth to it because since then, V2, V3, V4, none of these areas people have achieved as much, even half as much as what Hubo Weasel did in 10 years in 1960, 50 years ago, yeah? So that's something for you to think, Gee, something's wrong. We're asking the wrong question. What is being wrong? So today, I also like to say there may be something else unpopular in the sense that, well, maybe even V1 we do not understand as much as what Hubo Weasel thought we understood, yeah? And maybe that's one of the reasons that's wrong, and that's why, you know, in a sense that you are trying to go along the original path of trying to find the feature detectors. Okay, feature detectors point, feature detectors are, are, are lines, and next maybe triangles, next maybe face. Maybe this way of going is asking the wrong question, okay? So, so um, I'm trying to say maybe we should think in a new framework. So this is just published. So in a sense that, try something different, maybe we have a, a, a chance to uh, get some success, yeah? And let me uh, uh, explain why. First of all, think about what vision is, okay? And so unlike, for instance, you know, another way is an early, mid-level, high-level vision, or you know, primal sketch, two and a half set, D sketch, and 3D model, I like to put vision as encoding, selection, and decoding these three stages, and putting this selection as a center stage, which have been kind of a, not paid as much attention to computationally at least. So what does that mean? Because our retina receive lots of input, and uh, you know, we have like 10 million photoreceptors and 1 million out of the uh, retinal ganglion cells sent to the brain. That's about one megabyte of data in each image. And you have to receive about 20 images, 20, 30 images per second, like that. So there are 20, 30 images per second. Uh, in the f it's about 20, 30 books. You have to read each second. You can't read that many books. And the first stage, you may capture the image in your camera, in the retina, and then you kind of compress it. Data compression, efficient coding, another way of talking about it. How much can you compress? 10 times, 100 times, that's about it, yeah? And that's, that's roughly, if you calculate the information out of the um, uh, optic nerves, it's about one book, one megabyte, okay? But we cannot read that much. So we have this information bottleneck, which is less than one page of book you can read. It's about one or two sentences per second. So that's more or less saying that you delete most of the data, even if you do efficient coding in the beginning, yeah? So that, that makes you, you have already heard from Ruth's talk, Ruth Rosenholz's talk that attention makes us a little bit, you know, quite blind. This is basically saying you're almost 100% blind, yeah? So how do we select these, uh, these two sentences in a huge book? You select by moving your gazes about. So this is a, a picture on which this white are traces of uh, gaze selection. So you can select these two things and read, oh, that's David, and oh, that's Henry, or so on, yeah? So you move your eyes three times a second, select two sentences here, two sentences there to read. The rest you delete. So this is very counterintuitive for you to imagine because we do not feel that we are blind, right? But imagine if you're born without two eyes, would you know you're blind? Unless other people tell you, you would never know you're blind, yeah? So that's why we did not know we were so blind until recently. But if people tell you you're blind, you can, you can verify. Okay, no, of course, here is after you select these two sentences, you read the sentence and say, oh, that's David. So anyway, this is a data point you can measure yourself. Are you really blind? If you're not blind, these two images, the difference between these two images, you can tell immediately on the first glance, right? Most people, the first time they look at these two images, they cannot tell the difference between these two. That, that shows that you're indeed blind. No? What is the difference? Yeah, the airplane engine. Here's the airplane engine here, so there's none, yeah? And so it takes a few seconds, people still do not see it. So we are indeed blind, and so therefore you have to first look. You know, you say where to look, okay? 
So the idea is you're not supposed to read the whole book and find the two most important sentences and say, oh, I just look at these two most important sentences, yeah? The rest, you know, if I don't see the engine, that's fine, but I better see the tiger jumping at me, so I survive, yeah? And so therefore, you have to read the whole book and find which page it says tiger is jumping at me. That will take too long because you don't have this capacity. So the idea is you know where to look, up, uh, look for these uh, uh, before you even recognize the whole image. So it's almost like having a chicken without an egg. And so that is a very difficult task. So people will think about how to do that. And in, in psychology, it's called attention. So how do you know where to put your eye? Yeah? It's like in robotics, you say, where, where should I aim my uh, camera? It's the same thing. Yeah? So where should I look? And this is such an important problem. People think like, OK, maybe it's the higher area brain. Or the front of the brain, that's the smartest part that distinguishes us from other animals. We have the biggest frontal. Uh, so people used to think that to do such a clever thing of where to look is the frontal part of the brain to tell you where to look. And so I like to tell you, in fact, that's what primary visual cortex starts to do. It's not 100% doing by then. But if the primary visual cortex, V1, is already doing that, what does that mean? OK? Then you need to look at the whole brain vision very differently. You can't wait until there and do that. In particular, that's why there's a central vision. But anyway, a center of vision, a center stage of vision. I like to put this in center stage of vision. So what does that mean? So this is selection, is selecting the two centers. Of course, you can select and not, not able to read. Like a blind person can look but not see. Okay? Another, after you select, then you see. Okay? You only see these two centers, more or less. This is a caricature. Now, what does that mean also? It means that, well, anyway. Something else, okay. So before you select, it's the, the bit before you move your eye to was actually in your periphery. Then you say, oh, I select there. Then you put it, move your eye and put it in your central visual field, right? So therefore, it's your peripheral vision that tells you select here rather than there, okay? And then once you select, you put your center. So peripheral vision is in charge of looking, where to look to, and central vision is then do the seeing. Well, that already tells you that central peripheral vision are qualitatively different from each other, not just quantitatively different from each other, yeah? Okay? So if peripheral vision is in charge of looking, then maybe it's not so good at seeing. So that comes to the motivation of central visual, central, central peripheral dichotomy in, in vision, yeah? Okay. And uh, another thing, it means that if looking already started at V1, what does that mean is information start to be lost. So going from 1 megabytes to 40 bits, maybe already started around here, between V1 and V2. Yeah? Now what does that mean? How much is lost? 1 megabytes, 40 bits. Even if you lost half a megabyte, let's say between V1 and V2, you went from 1 megabyte to half a megabyte. That's a drastic situation. So if you want to measure receptive field again, you know, how do you measure receptive field? You say a neuron's activity spiking and see what is the input that gets to this neural activity, right? However, the, the information that gets to the neural activity is already starting to be lost. How can you measure receptive field? It will be very difficult to do that. Maybe this explains why the progress after Hubert Weasel has been more difficult than Hubert Weasel were doing because they they happen to be doing it before the information get deleted, yeah. How, how does the forty bits per second measured? Yeah, this forty bits per second was measured actually quite early in nineteen fifties. <laughs> it was when the information Shannon's information theory just came out in nineteen forties, and people start measuring the information capacity in telephone networks, you know, radio, and so on. And people measure information capacity in sentences. Then they say, oh, let me measure it in a, a human visual system. Okay. What they do is flash lots of pictures uh, on you. Let's say you flash 10 bits of information. That means you choose 1,024 images. They're all symbols like, okay, a cup, a dog, you know, these kind of a, or letter A, B, C, D. And you flash it to them, and uh, uh, observers just have to answer which one out of that. So if they can answer that, they give you 10 bits of information, right? 10 bits out of these 1,024, yeah? But it may be passed to the decoding stage, but yet people just simply may not be able to respond, right? If they do not respond, that means they did not go to the response stage, no? 
somewhere you just say don't know which bit is lost. This is the whole body, okay? If they cannot say it, it may be passed to my brain, but could not pass to my tongue. That's also possible. I can, but basically, uh, people, if they cannot say that, they could not send these 10 bits. Then you can flash it how quick until they could not say. That's how they get this 40 bits per second. And people also measure it in, in hearing, in speech, in, in other modality. It turns out that 40 bits per second is universal. Okay, so if you play the record speech, you know, video or, or audio too quick, people cannot hear beyond 40 bits per second. Yeah, uh, people cannot speak. Can you try to speak as fast as you can? How much you speak? You you measure the information uh, content in your wish speech stream the same. Okay, so so it was known, but somehow you know not taken up seriously. So therefore, if information start lost here, it will be very difficult to measure the field. So therefore, we need to change our research paradigm, do it a little bit differently, yeah? Okay. <clears throat> so therefore, this uh, motivates the talk outline. First of all, I'd like to motivate that indeed is the case that information selection start, looking start at primary visual cortex. That's just a bit review of a early work, although that, that kind of occupied me 20 years to do this. Uh, this. And then, okay, that's the main story. If you are looking with your central vision, or, or, or with a peripheral vision, then the central visual, a peripheral visual field should be different. And in what sense is different? I'm going to say that this difference is that if V1 starts here, feed forward to higher visual area and feedback. So I'm going to look at the feed forward feedback thing, which could be, I hope it's interesting to computer vision community as well, because a lot of these deep neural networks is mainly on a feed forward thing. And you can say how much feed forward thing can do, superhuman performance or not superhuman. And what is feedback made by you, yeah? Okay? And uh, with that, we are going to discuss what that means. For instance, you know, how, what does it mean that visual understanding? What does it mean visual illusion? People think, you know, you can have an ad adversary attack uh, um, to, to your uh, deep neural network because maybe you don't understand, you know, what does that mean, okay? So, any questions? Okay, so. First, let's motivate that indeed selection starts to happen in V1. So, selection, actually there's two ways of selection. One is the bottom-up selection, one is the top-down selection. So, for instance, you all direct your gaze towards me because you have a top-down task of listening to this lecture. So, you look at me, yeah? And bottom-up selection is if suddenly a tiger jumping on a window, you will be involuntarily shift your gaze towards it, even though you're supposed to listen to me, yeah? Okay. So that's bottom up. It tries to save your life in a very emerging situation. So for instance, in this picture, if your bottom up task is to look for a uniquely oriented bar, your attention should be directed to that bar. Okay, that's your task. However, all of you have seen the red bar, right? Even though a lot of you may not have seen the airplane engine, somehow this red bar involuntarily draw your eye to it. That's why you see it. Now, just to demo that, indeed, if you don't direct your eye to it, you can't see it. Stare at this letter V. Would you be able to tell the letter T there? No, you wouldn't, right? So if you don't direct your eye to it, you indeed can't see. You delete, okay? And so anyway, this red bar, you all direct your eye to it. So somehow it's bottom up attracted you. So therefore, if you allow me, uh, so people even when they're doing this task, their first gaze may even go there just like you're distracted to look at the tiger. And so to a first approximation, you may say, I focus on this because that's the most fundamental, you know, for cats and dogs and fish, they all have to do it. So fundamentally what visual selection is, is bottom up. Zero sort of approximation. And then you can ask, how does the brain do, do it? You know, this is a psychological black box way of describing it. You have a retinal input, somehow the brain has the black box to create it a, 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 a saliency map, I understand maybe Computer vision, you do saliency computation as well. And this is a map of the field with scalar values on it, and the higher value it is, the more salient. That means the stronger it is to make you involuntarily shift your gaze towards it. So that's an operational definition. You can measure how fast people shift their gaze, and once their gaze shifted to it, they'll be more accurate. You can see how accurate people recognize things on it, how fast. So that, that is not a, not a vague thing that you cannot measure, yeah? And so the question is where, which brain area is making this saliency map? And of course, as I said, people used to think that it's the clever part of the brain, frontal and parietal, and so on. And it's not without reason they think so, because people notice that anything could be salient. You could be salient because you're a unique color. You could be salient because you're a unique orientation. 
You could be salient because you're unique in motion, you know. And so therefore, it's a general purpose kind of a thing. It's so general purpose that it must be done by part of the brain that is not specialized into vertical bar or slightly non-vertical, horizontal, you know, what color, what else. So which part of the brain has a map of a visual field but doesn't have feature selectivity? You know, each neurons are not specialized to, yeah? So parietal and frontal part of the brain do have these visual maps, we'll tell you. Yeah, and so therefore, that sounds reasonable, and people probably familiar even in computer vision and ET cost salience in network and so on. That's indeed according to this plan. Okay? And uh, so, we need to think out of, out of this traditional box to understand that maybe it is V1. Okay? So anyway, this is what I proposed about 20 years ago. I said, well, the salience map is actually the neural activity map of V1. So V1 actually has a map of the visual world in terms of neural firing rate. So here's the equation, yeah? Equation on the behavioral terms, operational to attract your gaze, and equation on a physiological term, and this is my equation, yeah? And so that means, now at this location of the visual field, some neurons firing very high, let's say 100 hertz, and other locations maybe only 20 hertz, and so on, so this is a higher firing, and there, it will be sent to your muscle to make your eye movement. And that's, that's the idea. And so if you notice that V1 actually send fibers to superior colliculus, which is a subcortical structure, which then send signals to, it's like your spinal cord, but a bit higher, yeah? To the brain stay and go to your eye muscle and move your eye. So it's a very, this actually means that V1 is almost like a motor cortex, okay? Giving motor command to somebody to move the muscle. And uh, this is also known for more than half a century. But somehow, a lot of these disparate data sitting around in different fields and not, not quite connected. And so this is the superior calculus. It will read out. You download this to the printer. Okay, from CPU to printer, printer prints something for you. And this printer just shifts your gaze for you, yeah? That's the idea. Okay. And uh, same thing. At this particular location of V1, there may be many, many neurons. They all have their filter kernel or receptor field location at that location. Could be a thousand neurons. And so it, for this image, it will be a neuron tuned to vertical. They're responding very highly. For this uh, image, it will be another neuron that prefers to red color. Okay? It will respond highly. And for this image, it could be another neuron that prefers this particular location, uh, uh, move, because V1 is an overcomplete sampling of the visual field. And then at each location, there's lots of different scales, orientation, color, and depths, motion. Okay? And so, therefore, this single firing rate map, which is blind to exactly which neuron is giving this firing, it doesn't matter. The printer, all it needs to read is the scalar value of this firing rate, yeah? So if you think this way, then you don't have to wait until the parietal and frontal. This is much, much more economical because if you go all the way to parietal frontal, then come back to this, you know, it will be slower. Well, in fact, that's what top-down attention selection does. Okay, bottom up, you have to do this way. Okay, another thing is if you look at lower animals, they don't even have frontal. So how can they do that? You know, lower animal has more attentional bottleneck, more restricted. They got to do it too, right? So thinking of that way, so it's natural, not frontal and parietal. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so and then you may ask, uh, how, how do you do that? You know, this this particular bar. You know, Huber Weasel told, tell us that some neurons prefer vertical, some neurons prefer horizontal. But this vertical bar doesn't look any brighter or stronger contrast than other horizontal bar. How could it make this neuron fire so much? Is that because the Vertical neurons prefer, you know, sensitivity higher? No, because you can switch this around, this become a horizontal bar, and everybody else a vertical bar, it could still do that, yeah? And so it's not because V1 is built that it is prefers the, the red, uh, red and vertical, no. This is because actually in V1 it's more complicated, well anyway, <laughs> this is another philosophical word, it just means neural activity is doing that, and this is my cartoon to make people think beyond the traditional uh, Framework as if as if this superior clickers is an auction shop. Yeah, what is auctioning? The merchandise is auctioning is attentional selection, which means auctioning my gaze movement. Yeah, as an attention auction here, no discrimination between your feature preferences, only spikes count. So different V1 neurons come to bid for this uh, merchandise, and whoever bids more. So for this case, it's a color two neuron bids three spikes, and you know this. 
this uh, uh, neuron bids only one spike, so he doesn't win the bid and he does, and then he will award the gaze shift to that location of the visual field represented by this neuron, yeah? Okay. Anyway, this shows that V1 is actually quite complicated, not as what Hebrew Weasel classically looked at uh, as a receptive field, which is a you know, filter kernel base for each neuron. But uh, this represents about two, uh, three by three millimeter uh, cortical area of V1, but V1 is much bigger, I was just zooming. And each location is colored, coded to represent what is the underlying neuron's preferred orientation. Okay, so this is called orientation tuning map. So if a neuron prefer vertical, you, you color that bit of a V1 as blue. If a color prefer horizontal, you color them as reddish. So different preferred orientation are kind of clustered. You know, people prefer uh, color for vertical clustered here, horizontal clustered there, and so on and so forth. And on top of this is a superposed some black thing. Do you, can you see it? It's actually a, a, a neuron that's a parameter cell its cell body is in this verti uh, blue patch. That means this neuron prefers vertical, yeah, because vertical is blue patch. And it's sending axon collaterals, like a cable connections, to other blue patches. Somehow prefers to send to other blue patches, not red patches and so on. What does that mean? It means V1 is a recurrent network, such that neurons prefer vertical, like to link to other neurons also prefer to vertical. And these other neurons could be some distance away. That means their recitative field may not be that close by, okay? It could be one recitative field away, two recitative field away, and so on. But it's still finite range, okay? It's almost like a material science, solid state physics. You have a finite range, molecule, molecule interaction, okay? And this interaction is not isotropic. It, it's like like to like interaction. So if you like vertical, I like vertical, you interact. If you like vertical, I like horizontal, you're less likely to interact, okay? And this interaction turns out to be mutual suppression. So like to like suppression. In this case, if you have lots of uh, horizontal bars, they will ex excite neurons tuned to horizontal orientation, and then these horizontal oriented ne preferred neuron will suppress each other. But this vertical bar will excite a vertical preferred neuron, and this vertical neuron is not getting suppressed by neighboring neurons because the neighboring vertical tuned neurons are not being activated by visual input. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So this is how that location have high. So it's a very cheap and dirty operation. So that's how it works. And if you keep on having an electro stick to that neuron and recording that neuron's activity and change the horizontal bars to vertical in the surround, and these horizontal bars are outside the recitative field. So by Hubert Weasel's classical picture, it wouldn't matter, okay? But if you do that, suddenly that neuron's response get low. So it does matter. It matters a lot. It, cha it can change more than 50%. So it's not an approximate change, okay? It, up to 80%. So, so therefore, we cannot really ignore that. In, in, in fact, these kind of data start to appear in 1970s, very soon after Hubert Weasel. So therefore, it's not that we, we didn't have these data, but these data were originally viewed as kind of a nuisance for biology. You know, biology is never clean, so therefore, okay, we don't understand it, let's put it aside, yeah? And uh, so, of course, Hubert Weasel did it this way, mostly uh, with, with blank screen. You put a bar there, measure the rest of the field. Of course, if nothing there, it will still be very highly active, yeah? So it's a huge change from this and that same neuron. So is it really tuned to orientation? Yes, because you can change this bar's orientation and this neuron will fire more or less. However, you change things outside, so you also fire less. So what is this? Most salient bar, not very salient, and it's salient. So this is a saliency map. Makes sense, yeah? Okay? So that's feasible to be a saliency map. And what if you go back to this and you say, okay, now I'm going to put, put, put a, horizontal bar to it to make this cross. Is there any V1 neuron tuned to cross? Yeah, we, we don't think so, or we do not know they exist. Indeed, they aren't, even if they aren't. But it doesn't matter. All you need is now a horizontally tuned neuron getting excited, because that's not getting suppressed, right? And so this will have a high. So at this location, there'll be two neurons. One is a horizontally tuned neuron, one is a vertically tuned neuron. It's the horizontally tuned neuron is getting selected by, by, the, 
by the superior critics. So therefore, in principle, V1 doesn't have to be tuned to face or trees or dogs. All of these visual input will have some features excite V1 neurons. In principle, you don't need them. In practice, of course, you can have top-down factors to, to, to look at faces and so on, yeah? Or maybe your pet dog and so on. Okay. And, uh, well, when I first thought about this idea, I was myself suspicious. How could it be, you know? Is that really the case? So in order to convince myself first, I just uh, built a, a neural networks uh, model which, which is trying to mimic this recurrent interactions in V1 and trying to see, is it more or less do a feasibility study, yeah? Of course, the best thing is you go to the brain, measure if that's the case, but if you, it will be very difficult. So you do a software brain, simulate the brain, just make sure that simulation is not too outrageous because it has to be conformed to the biological plausibilities. And when you do that, you find that indeed that's the case, not only for these trivial-like things, you can also put in more complex things like you know, texture, which is notoriously difficult in computer vision, right? Texture segmentation, uh, figure one, you, know, the, you find that these, this network also will excite texture boundaries for you to make it very, attract your attention, yeah? Higher firing from V1 to texture boundaries and so on and so on. Very, very difficult. Of course, you say, okay, color boundary, it's very easy. In computer vision, you can do color boundaries, but texture is a very testing case. And you think it's, it will, so it's feasible, and then, um, yeah. But if you notice that this is called, uh, we call this like to like suppression, ISA feature suppression. So I try to put a general, ISA feature. So in this case, it's ISA orientation suppression. Yeah? In this case, it's isocolor suppression. Neurons tuned to same color suppress each other. So that if you're uniquely red, you will have higher activation. Okay? Neuron tuned to same motion directions suppress you. So if you are moving to prefer or moving to the right, I prefer moving to the right, I suppress we suppress each other, but not with other neurons to the right. And so therefore this is isomotion direction suppression. And so the ISA color suppression was seen in 2003 very clearly. In fact, earlier it's also seen, but just not highlighted. This is actually a review paper, 1985, describing lots of these ISA feature suppression kind of thing. And this Jones and all my colleagues in, in UCL, they, they really studied ISA motion direction selection. Yeah? And so these mechanisms are all available in V1. So uh, it makes sense. Now, can you predict something from here? And you say, okay, this pop out, this pop out, this pop out, but it's not really predicted by me. Before, before the theory came out, people already knew these things pop out to attract you. So in psychology, you use the word pop out to mean that it attracts your attention, okay? You just pop out at you, yeah? So actually, the, that's, that you basically make your gaze go to it. So can you predict something that people did not know? That's usually in, in natural science, you have a hypothesis, you better predict something people don't know, and you test it, yeah? <coughs> so is there something you can say, okay, i give you a hint. Isa orientation, isa color, isa motion, what is isa something else people have not seen? And hopefully this something else is very unique to V1. So what is the feature, that, you know, of course, I, I'm, I'm asking this question to the more natural science uh, 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 biological vision people, yeah? What is the feature that V1 is tuned to that other brain areas not tuned to? And you can predict that should also, if it's unique, will also attract your attention. Anybody? It is actually very difficult to think. It took me many years to think about that idea. In retrospect, it's so easy. That shows that our traditional way of thinking really is quite difficult for us to overcome. So the thing we predict is something invis invisible to you indistinctive to your vision, but never as it make you pop it or make you move your eyes, okay? You say, oh, this attract me because it's a unique orientation. I can, you can see it's distinctive. This red is distinctive, that, but I see something non-distinctive make you move your eye. What is it? It's called eye of origin. So imagine you make people see this image, you only give it to their left eye, okay? And so it turns out that in V1, some neuron tune to the left eye input, other neuron prefer left, right eye input, and that's only in V1, not beyond V1. So it's a unique V1 signature, yeah? And so imagine if you have lots of these bars that put one eye, uh, and you, you give them a task, give an observer a task, you find unique neuron power. They usually they press button within half a second, you find it very quickly. But imagine if you put one of these bars to the other eye, okay? 
They still see this. It's not distinctive. This bar look indistinctive from other bar. That's what I mean by it's indistinctive. Okay. So if you ask observers which bar is in a different eye, they cannot answer. They that I don't know. Okay. But nevertheless, the eyes of feature suppression applies to this as well. Neurons tune to the same eye suppress each other if it's different than not So this is seen by the Angelus et al. 1994, even though they only look at 12 neurons, but it's there. So that means this neuron put into the right eye is not having been suppressed, so therefore it will also have higher activations because it's a unique eye, and this have activation because of unique orientation. Yeah. So eyes to eye for origin suppression. So therefore, if you build a fire rate map like that, you will have two highlights hotspots. And the auctioneer may say, oh, which one pays more money? I should go look at which way. So if this guy pays more money, it should attract you. Okay. And if it even pays slightly less, you know, this auctioneer may hesitate a little bit. Should I go there, there, or something like that? And so that's a prediction that if you make people look for this uniquely oriented bar, they will be slowing down when this bar is in a different eye versus this bar is here. Okay. And that's indeed the case. In fact, it slows down quite a lot. In three out of four trials, if you attract their, attract their gaze, they go the other way. <laughs> so this is the tiger jumping at them. Yeah? So this is an example of looking without seeing. Remember, you need to have the egg, chicken without the egg. So you have to look before you see. You have to select these two sentences before you read it. So this is the selection. They did not see before they go. Yeah? Make sense? Okay. And uh, the reason it's a fingerprint of V1 is only V1 neurons are tuned to eye of origin, so this could not be done beyond V1. Yeah? And because it was so surprising, in fact, even uh, seasoned division scientists were surprised by this, so many people actually went back trying to see, is it really true? They did an experiment themselves. So this is actually replicated across multiple labs. Yeah? Okay. And then a more direct uh, test is actually in this uh, monkey experiment in my, with my collaborator Wu Li in Beijing and his uh, PhD student Yan Ying. And so what we do is make monkey fix it in central dot. Once they fixate it, we flash these bars on. The monkey's task is to find a uniquely oriented bar. In this case, it's here, but sometimes it's there, sometimes it's here in a different location, and so on and so forth. They have to suck out to it as soon as possible. So that's just more or less this selection task. It should be automatic. And uh, sometimes it happened to be where the resistance field we're measuring, okay? So we, because we implanted these Utah arrays into their eye, uh, into their brain and measure that. And this is the, uh, the, the plot of these neurons response. So this is the time starting from these bars uh, onset and this is their response level in terms of the firing rate of neurons. And uh, these neuron response starting 40 milliseconds, shoom, started really, really quick, start going. And the monkeys were fixated once it's on, the saccade is usually 200 milliseconds or later. So therefore, just before the saccade, you have a, a time where their eyes still fixate there, you can measure the risk of field responses, okay? And so if the theory is correct, then the higher responses should lead to faster saccade, <coughs> okay? That's the idea. Even if this is exactly the same picture repeated next time, of course, we are not repeating one trial after another exactly the same picture. Otherwise, the monkey can guess where the bar is, right? Monkey have to first of all find it and go. So it's really all these different, the same picture will actually interleave with other random. So each, each trial, monkey doesn't know where the bar could be, yeah? Okay. So we then sorted these same, <coughs> same input trials into the trials that monkey goes there very quickly versus trials that monkey goes there very slowly. And you find that, indeed, the trials that go very quickly, they have higher response right in the beginning. You don't have to wait. So that means it's not like V1 goes to V2, V3, well, then they calculate the same and come back. It's not possible, yeah? And this 40 millisecond latency is too short for V2 to respond, even for frontal eye field to respond. So it's, you cannot make it some, some high area. So this shows that V1 is like a motor cortex, sending the command to the superior collectors, and then superior collectors move the eyes. Yeah, that makes sense? Okay, and so 
Um, another thing is, you know, as a theorist, you also like to do things, you know, that's my physicist colleague always ask me, okay, when is it that a computation neuroscience can, can be so precise like physics? You know, you predict something, you don't have to fit your parameters, you know, whether it's thousand parameters or one parameter. <laughs> you know, it's just precise and it's a curve. Can you do that? And uh, so let's take up this challenge. No parameter, and you predict something quantitative, not qualitative. So <laughs> imagine you have these kind of input. Remember that, that the idea is you have <coughs> retina input, and then CDNC map, and go. So imagine this retina input, and you make people say, find that odd one out, and press button as soon as you find it. Okay? So you measure how quickly they press button as a measure of how strong that saliency map value is, yeah? By definition, the stronger saliency map, the quicker they press button, yeah? Okay, monotonic relationship. So, imagine, for instance, in this particular chart, you measure, you find that, hmm, RT stands for reaction time, okay? So I call it RT1, this is for the first instance, number one, is reaction time is 500 milliseconds, they press the button, okay? That's an experimental measured data point. Uh, imagine, in this case, the odd one out, they press button RT2, 400 milliseconds. Imagine you measure that to 400 milliseconds. From this theory, the highest firing rate is the saliency, make you saccade. Can you predict what is this ration time? Some neuron tune to orientation, other neuron tune to color. Can, can you predict? Exactly, 400 milliseconds, yeah? Because neuron number one, Fire some firing rate, who knows what, let's say 100 hertz, 400, 500 milliseconds. But neuron number two fires some other firing rate. Since it's 400 milliseconds, this firing rate must be higher than that firing rate, yeah? Because otherwise it wouldn't be shorter reaction time. That makes sense? So these two neurons, who is the higher? Must be the neuron for this higher. Well, that particular firing rate corresponds to that, so this is 400 milliseconds. That makes sense? So you just predicted something without a single parameter. So no parameter. Yeah? So we can do that, just like in physics. No fiddling, fitting. You predict precisely 400. Then you can go measure. Is it 400 or 410 or 300? You know? So then you can say, is this difference within statistical error margin or not within statistical error margin? Then you say whether your theory is correct or you can never test the theory is correct. You can only falsify theory. So whether you can falsify this theory, okay, by, by doing that. Okay, so, so this is RT3 is equal to minimum of RT1, RT2. This equation has no parameters in there. So measuring RT1, RT2, you can put it RT3 without a single parameter. And unfortunately, this prediction is wrong. Why? <laughs> this is a toy model of V1. Uh, because V1 doesn't just have neuron tuned to orientation, neuron tuned to color. V1 also have neurons tuned to both orientation and color. So that complicates things. So that, in fact, this will be less than 400 in case the third kind of neuron tuned to both orientation and color joining the game and upset you. Okay, so this is actually a toy situation. The real V1 is not like that. Real V1, they don't have that, but they happen to not have neurons tuned to both orientation and color and motion direction. They don't have that. Okay? So triple conjunction tuning they don't have. So then you just extend this mathematical derivation to a more complicated case. You can again arrive at equation without a parameter. And then you can have observed and predicted one on top of each other to see whether they're statistically different from each other. They're not. Okay. And so this uh, is making the theory not falsified. Furthermore, this also implies that beyond V1, it's not uh, participating in saliency computation. Now, why is that? Because beyond V1, neurons are tuned to orientation and color and uh, motion direction at the same time. So they would predict that it will be less than 400, or even this, it will be less than. So the predicted blue curve should be less than, a little shifted from the red curve. That would be the prediction if you involve more than V1. So the fact that the data shows it's not so, it's implying beyond V1 you are not doing this CDS. It may be beyond V1 is doing top-down attentional structure, but not bottom-up CDS, yeah? Okay, so now that we have that, we finally go to our main topic, so, okay, central peripheral dichotomy. If, 
information from one megabyte leaking out around selecting a V1 is leaking out. What's next? Uh, we're going to look at this V1 to higher visual areas. Uh, in particular, we're going to say central peripheral visual field may be different into V1 feed forward and feedback. So I like to look at feedback. So imagine that brain is limited. Of course, brain is limited in, in energy. We consume a lot of blood. We, you know, we cannot have a very you know, 10 ton brain and we only have a, a one kilo brain there. And so you want to say things you might imagine maybe periphery may not have enough feedback. Otherwise, the brain cables will be too much. The brain has to be too big. Okay? So how do you do that? You can open up the brain and see how much is feed forward feedback connection, but I can't do that. Okay? So I'll do it with a behavioral proxy use a behavior measurement to see how much is feedback. So what I do is using something very ambiguous perception so that you don't see something very clearly, you have to have a second look, okay? So if you try and feed forward sweep, it's like a deep neural network, you know, feed forward, you don't see some clearly. Maybe you don't know whether it's ostrich or not, it's a car, you know, some ad adversary attack. You may want to have a second look. So try to give some, some very ambiguous stuff to probe feedback. Oh, here is a demo of crowding, for instance. Uh, crowding is a, is a thing studied a lot by the vision community, but it's studied as a visual phenomenon. So hopefully this will also explain crowding. To fixate your eye to the cross, yeah? You can see the letter T, even if you fixate there. That means your visual periphery does have enough resolution to see the T, even though the resolution is poor, but in this case it's not. But if you fixate on this cross, somehow you don't see the T, even though the T is at the same location as that. So this is a demonstration that beyond the resolution, there's something else that's making you not able to see the peripheral thing, yeah? But anyway, maybe this is because feedback. I'm going to come to that. Okay, this, oh, <laughs> sorry, I, this is something else. I, I'm also giving you a demo that said looking and seeing are indeed two different things. Uh, this is something not that I initiated because traditionally there's also say where and what vision and in another language. I'd like to show indeed looking and seeing central provision two separate parts, I'd just like to advocate and banning a little more. So for instance, imagine you you have this input and I give you a task, look for a uniquely oriented bar. Yeah? Oh, you can find it very quickly. But if I add a horizontal bar or vertical bar on each of these bars, these are all 45 degree bars. Yeah? Okay? If I add to that, and I still say find that uniquely right tilted bar, see if you can do that. You can do that, right? But somehow it's a bit more difficult. Hmm? Why is that? We can analyze. Right there. V1 sees all these bars. Vertical, horizontal, left tilt, right tilt. But it doesn't see that two bars are crossed to each other, yeah? Two bars crossed to each other is a, is a letter X. But your higher visual area, clever, sees this letter X. And not only it sees letter X, if you rotate letter X by 90 degrees, it still thinks it's letter X. It's a rotational invariance, yeah? And so therefore, I think it's all letter X, so they get confused. And when they get confused, it will hesitate and veto. So in normal daily life, when you look and then you see, they are all consistent, mostly consistent with each other, such that you may not feel these are two separate parts. You think you're looking and seeing the same thing. And here is a laboratory, situa a laboratory situation where I make looking and seeing conflict with each other, so I can show you they are separate processes, okay? So I'm going to, you know, just to show you that if, if this X is a bit skinnier, then you don't have this trouble, because, you know, that's a different X. But anyway, if, if I show you this kind of image in the whole screen, and I'm going to ask you to look for this uniquely right-oriented bar, okay? Trying to turn on your V1, believe in it. <laughs> and shut down your higher visual area and say, where is this? Let your, okay, so where is this bar? If you see it, one person, two, not easy, yeah? It's there, but 90% of you have already looked at it. What happened is, People, I ask them to fix a star on center, then flash this on, they usually go there within one second. Well, not usually, half of the time. They don't need any training. 50% of the child, their eye go there within one second. You know, once, this is more or less go there and correct the saccade. But if you look at the center, 
you can't see that, right? Crowding, visual crowding, you can't see it. So therefore, this going there is before you see it. So your peripheral vision make you go there. Okay. Now, after the gaze goes there, well, actually, 90% of the child, within two seconds, people go there without training. That's why I say 90% of you, your eye have already gone that. Okay. But some of you, two of you, overcome this top-down confusion. So after your gaze go there, now this target is in the center of your visual field. Now you look and start seeing it. And when you see it, you get confused. And then you see and you hesitate and you say, oh, that's not my target. Keep looking. And then you went back again by saying, yeah. So that happened to most of you. And so seeing is something different and in central vision. Looking is peripheral vision, yeah. But anyway, trying to look at this, we use something ambiguous. So I give your left eye this image and give your right eye that image. And they're different from each other. They're constructed such that if you add them together, it's a grating stripe, which is not exactly horizontal, slightly tilted this way from horizontal. And you subtract them from each other, it's slightly tilted the other way from horizontal. And so they're, they're made such a way. And they're made such that they have equal contrast. Okay. Now why do I do that? Because efficient coding, it's from my, our previous work to show that efficient coding in V1 to make representation this way. So left and right eye versions become summation and uh, difference channels. And so V1 is having these two activations, then it's feet forward to, I ask observers say, what do you see? So they have to, by first choice answer, if I see tilted this way or that way. Okay, they have to say this way or that way tilted. And uh, this is what they report. This is the chance probability, the probability, not chance probability, just the probability that we report this tilt rather than that tilt, you see? More than 50%. Two thirds of time they say that tilt. One third of time say that tilt. Okay? Even though the fee forward contrast the same. So they have a bias. And this bias, I would like to argue, is my behavioral measure of top down feedback. Now, why is that? So the idea is V1 is shouting forward this tilt in one channel and that tilt in that other channel. So two channels conflict. So higher visual area have to think, hmm, what do you mean? It's very uh, ambiguous, so let me go back and check. So this is my hand waving of whatever you call it, Bayesian or non-Bayesian posterior reasoning. It says, if I perceive it, your monster's reasoning, yeah? <laughs> so far, if I perceive this tilt, it is my tilt. It's likely that my left eye also had that tilt and my right eye also has that tilt. Yeah, you have your internal model, your generative model of the world generating this, this synthesizing this input. And it would be nice if you can go back to your left eye and right eye to check it. It would be nice, yeah? But unfortunately, the brains don't go all the way to the retina. But it does go to V1. And so you're checking V1. But by V1, the representation is no longer left and right eye, but summation and difference. And so it will use summation as a proxy for left and right eye, but that's what, you know, that's what the internal model thinks. And so it go back and reason uh, to check and say, ah, yeah, makes sense, verified, yeah? And so you have a higher confidence to this because it's verified. But for same, when this, if it's verifying this, using the same internal model reasoning, it will go back and verify, uh, but verifying that because that's what the internal model asks it to verify, yeah? Now remember that after V1, you don't know the eye of, eye of origin information. So it has to go all the way back to V1 to verify. Remember that we cannot tell the difference whether it's left eye input or right eye input. Yeah? Remember, we can't tell. That also means after V1, you can't tell which one is summation, which one is difference. So to verify, you have to go all the way back to V1 to verify. Yeah? Okay? So I am trying to use this behavioral thing to see what is the back way or to V1. And when you verify that, you say, oh, you say it's still this way, but the V1 data tell me it's the other way. So you reduce the confidence saying that's not true. And when you do that, it gives you the bias. So this, this step is computationally called analysis by synthesis. I suppose lots of you have heard about that, yeah? Generative model. Okay. So this is a feedback recognition model, feedback generative model. 
And I, I can also use it as a more intuitive term. You feed forward, feedback, verify, and reweight your original two hypotheses. Original two hypotheses are weighted equally, then after feedback, you don't weight them equally. So you give a bias, and this gives you the bias. That makes sense? And so this bias is an indication of feedback. So that's my behavioral measure of feedback. Now, if you repeat the same measurement in peripheral vision, that means you don't make them look at here. You make them, uh, you make the stimulus in the periphery. They still stand here. They still have to say it's tilted this way, that way. You know, they will do that. And you repeat the experiment. You find that now it's 50%. That means they say this or that equally. Yeah? And no bias. This is, we did a control experiment just to see, is that because they can't see? Just like you remember, I asked you to see the letter T. <coughs> Verify when it's not ambiguous, they can't see. Okay, so if you put this tilt in two eyes equally, then they can see perfectly, 100% correct. So they can see. They, they do see. Okay, so in this case, it's because they don't have bias. So if we think the bias comes from top-down feedback, that means peripheral vision has less top-down feedback or no top-down feedback. So that's a theoretical proposal. Top-down feedback to V1 is weaker or absent in peripheral vision for the computation of analysis by synthesis. Yeah? And of course, as a theorist, sometimes we jump to conclusions too fast, so we have to be a bit careful, you know, do, do you think, oh, is that really true? So we, we try to do some kind of uh, additional things. So for instance, here the data is coming from when you display this for only 0.1 second, it's really quick. And you say, well, if I give more time for feedback, so you display twice as long, 0.2 second, then the bias should be higher. But if you let people only look 50 milliseconds, then bias should be less, yeah? And that's indeed the case. But it's only the case for central vision and not for peripheral vision. So as if central vision indeed, you know, have more feedback, and it makes a difference whether you display longer or shorter time. And also you can say, hmm, is this really special only for when people look at the tilt gratings? What if they look at motion? What if they look at color? Yeah? And so you're trying to check yourself because don't want to jump too quickly. And you do the analogous experiments in motion, you do analogous experiments in color, and it's still the same. Same thing. They prefer to view perceive that one, the in the summation channel. So if you look at the visual features, okay, motion, color, you know, tilt, so it's trying to cover these space. And then we then think, okay, maybe this proposal is correct. And again, we like to, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, the feed forward input is also not the same in the periphery, right? So maybe it is the feed forward input which is not leading to a strong feedback. Mm -hmm. That's right. Very good question. So, very good question. So you can say, is that because it's a feed-forward difference rather than feedback difference? That's true. So in order to do that, we did then control experiment, not to say whether it's this tilt or that tilt. Control experiment for, for grating detection. So make the grating really, really, really weak in contrast. They just have to detect it's there or not there. They don't have to see this tilt or that tilt. To alternative four choice experiment, and then you can measure the feed-forward sensitivities. Turns out that feed-forward sensitivities, there is a difference between the summation and difference channel, but that difference doesn't depend on whether it's central vision or peripheral vision. So feed-forward cannot explain the central peripheral vision uh, that way. Uh, and that difference is actually quite known. It's an analogy in, in color vision. Summation and difference do have different sensitivity. You know, summation in color vision is luminance, and difference is chromatic channel. Luminance and chromatic channel have different sensitivity. That's, it depends on the scale of, you know, grating scale. So these are to be expected, yeah? But now that's the important thing. They do not depend on whether it's central vision or peripheral vision. That's the critical bit, yeah? Okay. So therefore, the central peripheral dependence is more likely to be feedback. And then you say, okay, again, a theoretical thing, you know, you say, can you predict something that we did not know? It's not like an additional extrapolation from this. It's something dramatically different and trying to falsify the theory. So we try to do this in stereo vision. In stereo vision, there's something giving us an opportunity because they're very interesting about V1's activity and our perception. So 
This is done with uh, Master Sue from ETH, who was visiting me uh, in, in London. So this is, uh, we do it with random dot stereogram. So what is random dot stereogram? In each eye, you show them some random dots. Okay, you do not show them this circle, but the circle is just for illustration to show you what is the underlying dots. They are such that it's, it's a disk of dots in front of a ring of dots, okay? So how do we make that? You, you make that by first starting with a random dots of image, and then you add on top of it a central circle again, dots, same density. Again, this ring w was not actually shown there, just to illustrate. And you then copy this image to the other eye, exactly the same image, okay? And then you shift the central disk a little bit in, that's it. So this shift is called disparity, yeah? This is how the stereo vision works. And uh, in V1, if you put a V1 neuron residue field in the center, they, they prefer some disparity. So this is V1 V1 neuron's response in the vertical axis. This horizontal axis is, is this shift disparity, disparity positive, negative, no shift, zero, and so on. And so you can make different kinds of shift that you, uh, these V1 will prefer this disparity versus that disparity. So this disparity is 0 0.1 degree or something. So this neuron prefers the disk in front. When the disk is in front, this neuron fires, yeah? And that's, that's known, that's a monkey. Now we give them a different kind of disparity kind of a thing. This is uh, another random dot stereogram. Well, actually, exactly the same disparity, except it's anti-correlated. Now, what does that mean, anti-correlated? They, they are made exactly the same, except each dot in the left eye, if it's white, then it's black in the other eye. If it's black in the left eye, it's white in the other eye. It's only in the central disk, yeah? Central disk. And this is called anti correlated stereogram. It turns out that V1 likes this stereogram too. V1 neuron. So if you measure from this neuron again, it will have another disparity tuning curve. Yeah? What does that mean? Now, originally it prefers this disparity. Now its response is suppressed. So you give them this, it doesn't like to respond. But if you make the shift in the other way, now this neuron will fire. So the neuron prefers the opposite disparity. Okay, this is known. Now what does that mean? What is V1 neuron trying to say? So if you put something in front, the V1 neuron say, oh, it's in the back. So V1 neuron is telling fake news to higher visual areas, yeah? When you give this kind of input, when you give this kind of uh, ecological input, the normal kind of disparity, even when you are telling you the, the correct news, and but in this kind of way, telling the fake news regarding whether it's in front or in the back. And since V1 neuron respond that way, well actually, by the way, these, this can be understood by complex cell V1 neuron, because complex cell is respond, linear response squared. When you do that squaring, you find out this is how V1 neuron actually do the correlations between the left and right eye input. That's how I calculate disparity. And so if it's anti-correlated, it will flip. Yeah, That's, that is, is actually understandable. But anyway, even if you do not see the mechanism, you will know V1 neuron are telling the fake news. And people have been trying to say, can we see this fake news? Humans cannot see such stereograms. But if you think back retrospectively, it's like, gee, they always try to do it in central vision. Because they say, oh, can we see, can we see? We actually have a Vision Science Annual Meeting, Vision Science Society. This is kind of a spot in one of the demos. Can you see it? Everybody says, can I see it? Can I see? And so it really is imprinted in our brain that we cannot see such. So of course, there's theories talking about V1 is not consciousness. V1 is not equivalent to it. So those can explain maybe whatever V1 says you cannot. You know, not necessarily a conscious. But anyway, this is says you cannot see it. But in our framework, let's try to understand why. So V1 is feed forwarding the fake news, reverse steps to higher brain areas. Top down feedback because it's mm, it's kind of confusing. Let me feedback. And of course it says, well, if you're telling me this is in the back, I expect the shifting another way and come back to see whether the shift is that way. Not only I didn't see the shift, it probably also get confused how come black dot become white dot and vice versa and so on. So therefore you're telling me fake news. So that means you will veto this report from V1. Now what does that mean by veto? A veto means you can't see it, yeah? Because it doesn't believe in it. 
Yeah? And so therefore, now, if you propose that there's no feedback, that means you cannot read. That means you will just believe. You don't even know whether it's a fake news or true news. So you just take it as news. Yeah? So the prediction is in peripheral vision, we, can, we do see, see that. And so we then followed up to, to do this experiment. This is the probability that observer says it's in the front, and back, front or back in the correct way. Yeah? Oh, no, no, say front or back. So of course, each time they say front or back, 50% of the time they actually guess it correct. So therefore, if the probability correct is 50%, it's chance. That means they're completely guessing. Yeah? So central vision, it's indeed completely guessing, chance. They indeed could not see it. But in peripheral vision, they are much, much worse than guessing, are oh, very bad. Which means they're telling you the opposite. Yeah? They see the reverse steps. They see exactly what V1 neuron telling them. So they take the feed forward and see it. Does that sound like a, the adversary attack in DN DNN? <laughs> you can give it ostrich and they'd believe it's ostrich, even though it's a car. Yeah. Experiment actually work. How, how can you yeah. get it in the group? So, uh, I, I, I make people, so the, here's the disparity thing there. When it's central vision, I make them look at it. Mm -hmm. And they, then they have to press button front or back, front or back. And every time I record their front or back, whether it's correct response or incorrect. And when it's peripheral vision, I, I ask them to look above. Yeah, so they look above about. 10 degrees away, above. Uh, and I chalk their eye to make sure they are not cheating. And then they again press button front or back. And uh, if it's the normal stereogram, I make sure that they can see it properly. Some people's stereo vision not so good. There. And when they see it properly, they, I also interleave other trials. And then these are the same observers when they see properly. They, yeah. And so if you include the cheating trials, then Cheating trials, uh, actually, there are very few cheating trials. <laughs> yeah, so if you, uh, cheating trials, too few for me to say statistics. Yeah, it's very too few. Yeah, so most of the trials, they do not cheat. Uh, yeah, uh, so this indeed uh, is the case. And now let's uh, discuss a little, yeah? And uh, what does that mean? V1 have the visual field, oh sorry, feed forward, central and peripheral vision, but feedback more or less only central vision. That's, that's the cartoon version. And so let's discuss what that means. First of all, do we have evidence of that? Okay, this is a theoretical proposal. And it's very sad that I don't find any concrete evidence in monkeys. And these days, People can look at mice, but mice, you know, I'm not sure whether they apply. Because in monkeys, we don't have these genetic, optogenetic techniques. And people used to do anatomy uh, injections to the brain and then trace, you know, retrograde, integrate, trace, and gen to see where they aim, aim at. And these work are so tremendously tedious. You know, my colleague, uh, former colleague, uh, uh, Judy Hirsch, she, she will spend that. Uh, one year and only have 10 injections. It's really hard work. And so for 10 injections, one injection is good and one injection is bad, one injection near the fovea. One. So there's basically no, not enough statistics to tell the central peripheral difference in terms of, you know, is feed forward feedback where the central peripheral different, yeah? And so I'm very glad to hear now maybe Mama said to might give us some chance of uh, Changing this is a bit more clearly, so I hope there will be good evidence to, to test this. But in the meantime, let's look at some indirect indication whether that's the case. So here's a particular indirect indication. This is a piece of human cortex. Okay? You open it up and you find where V1, V2, V3 is. Okay? And the, the center point, this, uh, this star is the location where the fovea is. Peripheries are there. So fovea here, do you see that V1, V2, V3, V4, the fovea, they all converge at the same location. Why do they do so? 
So therefore, in the physical brain, fovea V1 and V2, they're very close together. But the peripheral V1 is here, peripheral V2 is here, peripheral V2, you know, they're further away from each other. Why is so? Because it's trying to save cables. If you have feed forward and feedback, it's so much connections, it try to get them close together to save, because otherwise your brain will be too heavy, yeah? So the brain is folded in such a way that the cables tuck on each other. The more cable it is, they get closer, so they have to save space. So if that's the case, this is consistent. There's more cables in central vision than peripheral vision. Okay, you have a feedback cables, yeah? And uh, we also have something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you, you have this magnetic field pulse, boom, hit the brain. It's this part, that part. You can have a local hit and a local temporary disturbance to that brain area. Yeah? And uh, they are very precise temporary. So you, if you hit at this time, it only has an effect of a very brief time. So uh, Pascal Leone and uh, Walsh did this experiment. They, if you hit V1, you create some flash of light in people's visual field because you just excite V1. This is called false thing. Okay? And if you hit another area, which is called MT, which is somewhere there, a bit higher, you also create a force swing. But these two kinds of force swing look different, yeah? Because you just excite them neuron. And you want something, they look slightly different. And then they find something very interesting. If you just hit MT, right after you hit MT, 25 milliseconds later, you hit V1. What, what should subjects see? Should they see the phosphine like the MT type phosphine or V1 type phosphine? Turns out that they don't see the MT type phosphine, even though that's hit first. They see V1 type of phosphine. This is because, you know, this is an explanation. You can still try to say it may be wrong. They say, well, the brain just says, is it really? You just flash the light and go back to verify. By the time it verify, it sees the V1 other type of phosphine, yeah? So that, that's another indirect. It's not complete. It's just indirect evidence. Another now to talk about information bottleneck. We say that it goes from one megabyte to just two sentences. And we say that it starts at V1. Okay, very start at V1. So you can ask what kind of information is lost starting from V1. We already know that we cannot see which eye sees what. Yeah, so eye of origin, stereo information in, 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 in computer vision, you know which camera sees what, yeah? Even if you may not know where the camera is. You see this camera one sees this image and camera two sees them. Humans don't have that. We are starting at that, lost. And some spatial detail lost. Exactly how much is the loss? I think it's an empirical question we need to understand. Does it go all the way from one megabyte to to one two sentences, uh, you know, 50% loss or 90% loss, that will help us to understand the rest of the visual system. Yeah, so that's a very important question that I think we should study. And all, also, top-down feedback is not just for analysis of synthesis. Well, you, if you feed forward so little information, what if you really want to see something clearly? You may want to query for more information, right? So you say, oh, is it really a cat or a dog? Okay? Is it a 50 50? Could be a cat and could be a dog. You go back to query to V1, and V1 say, oh, it's dog. You, would you, you just get one more bit of information, right? So it's a query for more information because the bottleneck is very small. So top down query, yeah? So, and of course, analysis by synthesis is another. Related idea, this, this has been going on since 1950s, and of course, in Germany, you know, Helmholtz think about uh, this, this uh, uh, perception as inference, uh, but the detailed form of, of analysis and synthesis coming from later. So I like to follow this tradition except to motivate further by the idea that because information is starting to be deleted, that's why you have to query. It's more than just uh, recognition by generative model. Yeah, you have to query for information. So that that is another way of uh, looking at the, some old idea and and putting some new new motivation for it. Yeah, okay. And crowding, we have heard crowding from Ruth Rosenholz, 
uh, and many people have studied crowding. There are also do some uh, related thing, uh, you know, for instance, like a metamus and, and so on. And so we have heard like a summary statistics. Imagine why do we have crowding? Information start to be lost. And we are focusing on central vision. So, so the information loss perhaps in the peripheral field is much, much stronger. And worse yet, you cannot query in the peripheral field. You can query in the central field. So therefore, even if you fix it here, you really want to see that your, your top-down attention covertly trying to query that you can't. Yeah? <sighs> you know? So that's, that, that could be the reason. Yeah? And so hopefully, we have wealth of data on crowding, and there's many different ideas behind them. I like to contribute another idea to, from this point of view of feed-forward feedback. You just can't feedback to verify and query in the peripheral vision, that, that may be the reason behind crowding, yeah? So, uh, visual illusions. Now remember, we say that peripheral vision gives you fake news that you cannot veto. Okay, the fake news means that uh, th these are kind of things that you almost cannot realize. In, which basically, it's not consistent with your internal model of the world. Uh, it's not easily realizable, the retina input to your laboratory put it, uh, that it doesn't happen in real world. Okay? And indeed, we find that a lot of visual illusions are much stronger in periphery. Well, because you can say illusions are fake news, right? But you cannot veto it. Show you some examples. You, are you familiar with this illusion? Does it look stronger in peripheral vision? It's a static image. You see that it's rotating, yeah? But if you really stare at it in your central vision, it's not moving. But if you, <laughs> do you see that? Okay. That's the one example. Another example is this. Herman grid illusion. Yeah. And here is another example. Okay, let me just copy this. Okay. I was trying to search for it. I say this. Here's an example, really nice, by Arthur Shapiro. Uh, you, you stare at this. If you look essentially, this ball is falling down. If you look away, this ball is wobbling around. Yeah. Very strong in periphery. Yeah. Okay. And so, a lot of these illusions are stronger in periphery, but some other illusions are stronger in central visual field. So, so I like to propose, now we, illusion is a big minefield, you know, we have collected over so many years of visual behavior. Can we categorize them according to whether they are stronger or, or in central or peripheral visual field and infer that they are caused by feed-forward fake news from V1? So that corresponds to V1's input, which is already information deprived. Yeah, a lot of information. That's why they look fake. Well, not look fake. That's why they could cause fake news. Information deprived. Yeah, and uh, on the other hand, if this particular phenomena or illusion is stronger in central vision, maybe it's caused by top-down feedback. Now, can we think of something that's stronger in central vision? I'm not sure, but here's an example. Visual backward masking. Visual backward masking is that, remember I say that if you, remember I said that if you hit MT, then you hit V1, then somehow the MT thing is, is vetoed. So, so, so same thing in visual psychophysics. You can show something, somebody image, image number one, immediately replaced by image number two, somehow they don't see image number one anymore, compared to if you image number one immediately remove. So basically, this give a feed forward input, then immediately this feed forward by the time this feedback and I hit it and just conflict, yeah? And so if that's the case, you can predict that stronger masking in central vision but not in peripheral vision. And this is something we are actually trying to test in the laboratory. And so with this, you can then study illusions can give us a, a, a kind of a handle in studying the brain circuit. So that will be very useful. 
And this is uh, for people who study uh, you know, cognitive psychology and high level of attention. People are familiar with this classical work from Treisman talking about feature integration theory. The idea is you know, the attentional spotlight move around and uh, within the attentional spotlight you bind features together, feature binding. So for instance, the redness and verticalness bind together, it's red vertical bar. Greenness and horizontalness bind together, green horizontal bars. But outside the visual attentional window you will see illusory conjunctions. So if people briefly show this immediately taken away, they will also see red horizontal, which is not there, or green vertical, which is not there. Because your, your central vision is not enough to scan. Yeah? And uh, so this is kind of a related to, so therefore, we will then add to it to say that the feature binding actually involves top-down general feedback. It will veto the illusory conjunction. It will only accept the correct ones. But it can only do that in central version. Yeah? So that relates to the old, uh, very traditional theory by this mechanism. And uh, feed forward deep neural net. Yeah, we know that they, they can achieve superhuman performance. But if they only do feed forward, they can imitate more or less peripheral vision. So you can imagine they are peripheral vi vision machines. Imitations of peripheral. How much imitation is another matter? But at least we know they suffer from adversary attack because you, you can fool them. And so therefore, if you want to have them not being fooled, one way is to imitate human's feedback. But this human's feedback is only central vision. But computers maybe you know, can afford to have more cables, can afford to have superpower. Um, in that case, you can really be superhuman computers, yeah? Deep neural net by having feedback also in peripheral vision. Maybe that will be useful. And um, we know that in human and in monkey studies, there are things like you know, occluded image and so on, that the feed-forward network will, uh, will have trouble, but humans don't have trouble as much. But you can measure, so for instance, Tan et al. measured uh, patients when they have to do surgery. Before they do surgery, they implanted it actually in their brain. And they find that if you show them these occluded, challenging, ambiguous input, they have no problem seeing it, but if you look at their brain, they, you find that their higher brain areas, like in the temporal cortex, their response latency become longer, okay, compared to the trivial ones that can go very quick, non-challenging. This imply or hint on there is a recurrent processing going on, yeah? So, you know, iterative, initial, iterative, feedback, iterative, and that, that can make their response. So the latency where it appears the signal of what the input is, is longer, yeah? And um, we, 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 we are talking about why these networks don't have visual understanding. You can say, what does that mean by visual understanding? So when we talk about the internal model of the visual world, we say, okay, if I see David, David wears glasses, David has black hair, so you have an internal model. And this internal model, you have to come to analysis by since they come back. And so, Visual understanding should, should involve the generative internal model, yeah? And in this sense, when you don't have understanding, you can, you can be fooled more easily, yeah? And we see that in machine, we see that in our, in our human peripheral vision, and, uh, and, and in our human peripheral vision, remember I said that the peripheral vision is for looking, so you, you look there, put it in your central visual field. So recently, there's also work noticed that the feedback from the peripheral visual field in higher visual areas to central visual field in a lower visual area. Why? Because when you look, the next step is in fovea. So therefore, it makes sense for the, yeah? Because time-wise, it's a dynamic system. Come back. And so, in this sense, you can say our human peripheral vision in the natural world, because the minute you select that, you go immediately. So therefore, you do not feel you don't have visual understanding because the feedback immediately comes to your central visual field. Yeah? So we feel that we do understand everything. We have a perfect view of the world and stuff. But if you force people, when we did this experiment in this random dot steward where subjects actually really complain, I'm completely guessing. Because remember, we track their eye and make sure they don't cheat. So they could not do that. 
So they're actually not very confident. Even though they did very well, they're not confident. In a sense that they lack this understanding. They just rely completely on V1. So, so you need this feedback somehow to give you this understanding or confidence. I don't know how to, you know, I'm a little bit vague here because this is just for discussion. I like to share with you this. Lots of questions that we don't, we're only beginning to ask. We don't know how to solve them, address them. I, I love to, you know, hear your feedback about them. Um, yeah, and also you can say, well, you're talking about primates, but how about other animals, yeah? You know, for instance, rodents don't have a phobia. They don't gaze shift, yeah? Well, they move their eyes. Well, no, no, sorry, move their head. Moving head is also to put things somewhere, yeah? And what is their central vision? Even though they don't have a fovea, they have a center nose snout. They have a whiskers in the center, yeah? And all of these is like center, central sensory. Let's don't just call it vision. We say it's a sensory, yeah? Yeah, you, you go from peripheral sensory to central sensory. So in other animals, the central sensory could be whiskers, snouts, nose, you know. And the babies, when they were born, everything they put in their mouths and, nose, you know, so, so yeah, they also sniff, sniff out where their, where their mother is and so, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so uh, this is my proposal that we could try a new framework to understanding vision, not following the traditional pathway of feature detectors, feature detectors, feature detectors. It's very successful all the way to V1. Beyond that, we can add on another way. We can think about information start to be lost right here, starting V1. Exactly how much is lost? Is it 50% starting to be lost and 80% is something we should look at it? And maybe so how much is starting on V2, V3, V4? And uh, um, yeah, and uh, there should be essential peripheral dichotomy in terms of feedback, in terms of many other ways of thinking about it. And we have such wealth of uh, lots of old data we can re-examine, putting the new idea into them, and so that the rich field of vision can still have a lot to answer to us. Yeah. So with this, uh, thank you very much, and I'd love to answer more questions. <laughs>